This is my uh, lesson six alternative assignment. And just firstly, um, going over the McGraw-Hill assess self-assessment on conflict management styles. I got a 10 in competing, 11 in accommodating, 13 in compromising, 13 in avoiding, and 12 in collaboration. And I was just gonna go through the textbook, the Folger et al, and look at the top three that were specific to, to me. And so for compromising, the book defines that as when a party looks for a trade-off where a goal can be achieved by foregoing another goal. And in these events, both parties usually have to give something up um, in return for something else. And so the party is going to be looking for fairness in that they're seeking to empower both themselves and the other party. And sometimes the party may have difficulty explaining the reasoning behind what they want and what they're willing to trade. Um, and then the book describes two kind of subcategories of this, one of which being firm compromising, in which you know the trade-off's still being offered, but in this case, the party is not particularly flexible um, and with the offer. And usually this type of person is more assertive and usually leads the conflict a little bit. And then the flexible compromiser, uh, they have a less defined position and so are at least moderately flexible in what they're willing to trade off and receive. And one of the problems with this style, according to the book, is that each party has to give up something they value. And so a lot, in a lot of ways, conflicts um, that are resolved by this method um, lead to some disappointment and actually possibly um, ongoing conflict. Um, and also that's kind of the thing that sets it apart from collaboration because um, they do have to give up something they value in this style, the compromising style, whereas in collaboration, um, the goal there is that the needs are net, uh, the needs of both parties are met. And um, anyways, going back to avoiding, which was the second one that I was going to describe and look at the book with. Um, so the book talks about this is deliberately withdrawing from conflict or steering conversations away from the conflict. And um, there aren't too many benefits of using this method, but I identify it with it quite a lot. Um, and the main problem is that nothing gets resolved. And so resentment might be bred by this on either side because they haven't gotten to air their grievances and it carries over into the whole dynamic of the relationship because there's unresolved issues kind of going on in the background. There were three different um, types or subcategories or subtypes, if you will, that the book talks about. The first one was protecting, in which the person avoids conflicts at all costs, including using counterattacks and things like that to completely steer away from it. And then there was withdrawing, which was somewhat more flexible, and they use a technique called fogging, which I identified with, and, and what the book describes that as is acknowledging only part of the criticism or trying to breeze over it to act like it's been addressed when really it wasn't. And then the last subtype was smoothing, um, where the party accentuates the positives and denies the existence of negatives. Um, and that's like when someone brings up a point in a conflict or a criticism, you know, um, that party would accentuate a positive aspect of it to try and breeze over the negative parts. And for collaboration, uh, the book seemed to favor this style as maybe the most effective. And this one is de described in the book as um, a method where the goal is to meet the needs of both parties. And um, in this case, both parties are concerned with their own and the other's needs and are therefore flexible. And the book gives three conditions where this style would be taking place and it's that all parties must have vested interests. Parties must believe they have the potential to resolve the conflict in a way that satisfies all major interests. And parties must be willing to set aside hostility toward the other party. And this is, um, a particularly I think difficult method of conflict resolution because of how time intensive it is and it requires a high level of um, information about the situation on both parties ends and also um, an open communication climate where people are bouncing ideas back and forth and really open and, and honest about where they're at with things 
And um, like I was, had just said, it kind of it requires a great deal of time and energy, which is in some ways the negative aspect of it because in a lot of cases this might lead to one or the other, one of the two parties reverting to um, a worser style of conflict resolution. Um, and so that was it for part one. And then looking at the article, which I really enjoyed, it was talking about managing stress, you know, quick stress relief and emotional awareness as it relates to conflict resolution. And as we've discussed in, or read at least in former chapters of the textbook, uh, managing stress is really important to successful conflict resolution. Remaining calm and alert and driven um, is necessary to participate in effective communication to avoid um, cases where you know stress is blocking one off from hearing and interpreting what the other party is saying verbally or non-verbally, and also interpreting one from um, excuse me prohibiting one from interpreting their own feelings or needs. And so it asked, how do I relieve stress in the moment or do I, I think, um, I think quick stress relief is something that takes practice and doesn't necessarily occur automatically for people. And for me, relieving stress actually isn't so often happening in the moment, but it's kind of something that I feel like I've prepared for. And what I use is a meditation regimen, like a daily morning meditation regimen, as well as like short mindfulness meditations. Um, and I think that those have granted me the ability to be better in tune with my body's signals about stress building up and the mindfulness aspect of meditation allows me to feel kind of less controlled by my thoughts, which, um, kind of indirectly helps keep stress at bay, I think. Um, and it allows me to feel like I understand that my thoughts aren't something that I have to act on. And it's also been important because it's like a meditation for me is like a, a big breathing exercise. So it's a, it kind of like, I already have it built in to like make sure that I'm breathing and things like that. And I think taking a pause and breathing is a kind of a quick stress relief thing. And um, so that's one of the ways that I relieve stress and it's not so much in the moment again, but it's more of like a preparation thing where I've, I feel like I've built up to being able to handle when stress comes up. And then as it relates to emotional awareness, I'm not historically particularly good with that. Um, but I think over the last five years or so, I've gotten a lot better at it because I've kind of been forced to work on it just due to circumstances in my life and stuff. But one of the things that I've gotten really good at is being able to tell when I'm starting to feel a lot of negative emotions like sadness, anger, anxiety. And usually I can feel those like in my stomach or chest area. The only problem that I'm hoping to work on and, and what I address later on in, in this brief presentation is that I don't often know what to do with the information, you know, like I'm feeling sad, ang angry or anxious and I'm like, so what, what do I do now? Because often I'll avoid whatever it is that's making me feel those, those emotions. Um, and so moving on to the last portion in terms of getting better with emotional awareness in the future, I think that I need to pause more and explore the why of what I'm feeling, like where did this feeling come from or what led up to me feeling this way. And I think this helps to give context and also provide experience for the future so that my emotional awareness continues to improve over time. And I also think that it will help with um, me being willing to participate in conflict resolution as being avoidant, like just having the awareness of hey, this stuff's coming up, but that doesn't mean I need to avoid conflict altogether. And so I hope using this tactic will help in work situations with my boss and my boss's boss, who I interact with regularly, because these are relationships where um, historically I don't feel comfortable participating in conflict, even in cases where I sometimes probably would need to. So I think, therefore, that this will look like for me um, practicing my quick stress relief in terms of like the breathing exercises in the moment and also continuing my meditation regimen and emotional awareness improvement um, and considering like the why of my emotions um, will help me to participate in conflict resolutions in cases where it behooves me in my relationships with my bosses and things like that, like I said, as opposed to avoiding them.